Well, I want to echo uh, what you've heard from uh, folks already. Thank you all for coming here and, um, uh, and advising in us and giving us input about some key questions that we had that you've heard uh, stated already. Uh, let me point out, NHGRI sort of took the lead in organizing this, uh, but by no means is this really a workshop for us, as you're going to see in some of the things I'm going to show. This is really something that has become of great interest to NIH, um, but we were certainly willing, uh, for reasons I will explain in a minute, to take the lead in trying to see this um, workshop become organized. I, I think really what Francis pointed out uh, about the, this inventory of something on the order of 65,000 genomes to be sequenced or exomes to be sequenced in really the next uh, short period of time. Uh, the, of course, all of you are recognize that the reason this has all become possible, of course, is because this precipitous drop in the cost of DNA sequencing shown here, this uh, iconic graph that we show frequently for the data that we've collected for our, our three largest sequencing centers, but I think it's emblematic of the state of the art uh, with respect to the field of, of genome sequencing. We obviously have as our, as NHGRI's flagship effort in our extramural research program, our genome sequencing program, which we renewed last year. And um, while it has uh, several new components of it that capitalize on new opportunities created by the reductions in the cost for genome sequencing, um, nonetheless, it still has in place as the major component of that program our large-scale uh, genome sequencing centers at Baylor and at Broad Institute and at Washington University. And, and shortly uh, this evening, you're going to hear from Rick Wilson, who directs the, the, the Genome Institute at Washington University. So we, of course, are thinking critically about how to capitalize on this prodigious amount of sequencing capacity just in these three centers alone and institutes uh, alone. But the fact of the matter is there's others that we support and there's, of course, others uh, that, um, that we're very interested in as well. And just recognizing that capacity, we want to deploy that capacity in the most effective way possible for our specific scientific objectives. That said, we're not the only ones, of course, who are thinking about this. And the reason for it, of course, is that these technologies are just resulting in a massive dissemination uh, with respect to genome sequencing capabilities. It is not just NHGRI leading the way with respect to having the, the bulk of the sequencing uh, funding that's going on, but rather um, uh, the reason you see these tables around this room filled with um, individuals from other institutes is because Virtually all the NIH institutes are getting involved in this and using these same technologies for doing genome sequencing for their studies. If you actually want to see some real data for that, to put it in context, and to also show you the trend, if you just do, um, in fiscal year 11, query the database of NIH grants, and if you use the key term genome sequencing, um, it's very interesting what it reveals, and especially if we, we can do a similar query over several years. So this is just some real data to indicate it. In blue is money that, um, in, this is in dollars, millions of dollars. Um, blue is Genome Institute, red is everybody else at NIH, all the other institutes. If you go back as recently as 2005, 2006, you can see that 68 or 70 percent or so of all grants given out keyword genome sequencing would have been NHGRI grants. But now you can see, fast forward to last year, we have complete data, and in fact, the majority of the dollars being given out keyword genome sequencing end up being outside of NHGRI, not even NHGRI. You can also follow this for grant numbers. And this is a little deceiving because, of course, we give out a handful of very large grants. But nonetheless, the trend is pretty clear, that just in terms of total grant numbers where once upon a time we were hovering around a quarter of all the grants um, that would carry the keyword genome sequence, you can see a considerable drop off in 2011 um, uh, with a much larger number of grants uh, going, uh, given out by other institutes. This is actually a good thing. I don't want to portray this as anything but a good thing. It's the dissemination of genomic capabilities across other NIH institutes. Of course, we also have to realize that the same capacity that will be, end up being used to generate genome sequences, especially if human, is not going to just be limited to the NIH. I would point out there's various other major players that are, are relevant to consider and that we are certainly in contact with many of these. Certainly there's very large operations such as BGI and certainly the Sanger Institute. I could have put here in this column, I don't know, 10 or 12 different ones. I just grabbed a few uh, places I know that have some reasonable amount of sequencing capacity, but there's many others. Um, and, of course, there's the private sector, of which just a couple examples are shown here, with, with de who are developing considerable amounts of sequencing capacity as well. So in thinking about all the sequencing capacity, whether it be at NHGRIs, whether it be other NIH institutes, whether it be others in, in the international sphere or private sector, 
Uh, of course, NHGRI is very interested in thinking about strategically how to deploy that for various purposes. Um, that is best encapsulated in a strategic plan that we published in February of last year that I know many of the people sitting around this room have seen. Uh, this was, again, written and um, the strategic planning was carried out by NHGRI, but in fact is very much on behalf of the whole field of genomics. And we recognize that um, many are going to be pursuing the kind of objectives we lay out. This is sort of the iconic figure from that paper that portrays various domains of research activities um, going from more basic side to the more clinically applied side over different time intervals. I just want to focus your attention because what's relevant to this meeting is this slice here. Really using genomic approaches, in particular genome sequencing, to help us understand the biology of disease. And I think that's what Eric Borwinkel set up in some of the early points in his talk was the idea of really focusing our attention especially on, on complex genetic diseases. And represented in this time interval where we're sitting is right in here, the next decade. And what we predicted in our strategic plan was that this was going to be a very intense decade with respect to genomic achievements and pursuits and projects that were going to be in particularly uh, relevant to this middle domain. And of course, that likely will continue even beyond 2020. So we are looking towards this next decade and beyond, and we at NHGRI, but as Francis alludes to, and it's certainly the case, it goes beyond NHGRI and all of NIH is really thinking towards the future. What are the right kinds of studies to design that would maximally capitalize on the kinds of sequencing capabilities that we have? I will tell you quite candidly, the reason we have workshops like this is don't think for a minute we know precisely uh, how to execute on this kind of a vision. We very much aim to learn. We are still students at this. These are very hard problems, and NHGRI is continually trying to gain this kind of input, and I think others at NIH certainly are as well. As Francis alluded to, we need to design the best uh, of and most effective uh, studies for pursuing these goals, how to be most efficient, um, thinking about all the various options that one has. And so, as Eric Borwinkel nicely laid out, there are many issues and there are many questions, and they're just sort of shown here. He actually went through many of them bullet by bullet, but we're going to come back to these over and over again um, throughout this workshop to try to see, as we are trying to learn, what we can come to conclusions with respect to the trade-offs and the various issues that we need to try to address and to try to answer these fundamental questions that will help guide the design of some of these future studies. So once again, this is sort of a backdrop for why we are here, and we're really eager to, to discuss, debate, strategize, and hopefully try to answer these questions. So with that, I will stop. And Terry, do I turn this over to someone, or you're going to take over? Eric. Or Eric's going to take over. Excellent. Thank you.